uh, as John said, I'd like to kind of give more general overview of this relationship between sociology and warfare. And the Russian invasion of Ukraine obviously has shocked uh, many people, uh, particularly in Europe, uh, because there was that kind of widely shared expectation that uh, it was fairly unlikely to see another war on, on, on European continent in, in, in this time and age. And we could see that a lot of journalists and analysts have made that point early in the war, uh, using terms like a Cold War relic or remnant of the barbaric past and things like that. In part because we are, in, in many respects, I think, after the Second World War, uh, shared this almost teleological view of history that, you know, war events are something that uh, has nothing to do with, with modernity. But obviously, sociologists are quite aware that's not the case. And even though I think a lot of mainstream soci sociology since 1950s until maybe perhaps uh, last 20 years or so, has uh, downplayed the relevance of uh, war. In some instances, over, or, or, I, I could argue that it, it, it has ignored the war completely. It, it has associated the study war, something that belongs to history or international relations, uh, or kind of there was that perception that if we study uh, these, these issues, this is something that military sociologists do, and the focus is really on civil, civil military relations, on, on armed forces and things like that. So, so in that sense, war has been perceived by many as an apparent external phenomenon that might you know, periodically appear somewhere in the world and interrupt normal social life. But actually, obviously, if you look historically, as, uh, as a historical sociologist, we know that war has been uh, uh, historically more of a norm than an exception, uh, particularly over the last 5,000 years. Uh, so in, in that context, it is really important for us to understand this dynamic, the way how war has sh shaped and changed society and the legacies of previous wars that we very much lived through. Uh, so in that sense, uh, there was a certain shift, I would argue, in 1980s, when some historical sociologists have started to take uh, the study of war more seriously, obviously Charles Steele, Michael Mann, uh, John Hall, a few others. Uh, uh, but even then, the focus has been mostly on, on, on state formation, trying to understand how states came to be, uh, and the emphasis has been on, on war as a kind of this, this uh, principal element of shaping the states, but there hasn't been much extensive analysis of, of uh, uh, the, the impact war has on social change, also the micro dynamics of uh, organized violence. Uh, so this, this has happened really much more recently. Uh, I, would, I would argue that it's really from 1990s, uh, and, and uh, John has mentioned Mary Calder's work on new wars uh, uh, in the context of uh, you know, collapse of the Yugoslav uh, State Federation, and then obviously later on Afghanistan and Iraq, and more recently Syria, and obviously now Ukraine. All of these ongoing wars have kind of impacted on, on, a, on a kind of more, there is more interest now in the, in the sociology of war. Uh, so we do have kind of a number of political historical sociologists who uh, have studied different aspects of uh, a relationship between war and society, looking at social stratification, looking at gender dynamics, looking at uh, nationalism and war, and, and lots of other topics. Uh, so what's also important for us is really to look uh, uh, more kind of historically in the way how war has shaped many different institutions that we take for granted in modernity. Uh, so, you know, we can start from the nation state, the dominant uh, a polity uh, in the world in which we inhabit, as, as we know from research, Wimmer and Zhao and Miguel Centeno and a few others, we, we, we know that this form came to be, uh, you know, has replaced empires in many respects, patrimonial kingdoms, city states, through, through warfare. So we see this period, particularly in the 18th, 19th century, when wars and revolutions intensify, and, and the outcome is really the state that we inhabit today. Uh, we can also look at the way how democratic institutions emerged in relation to war. All the way from ancient Greece to medieval Switzerland, democracy was a product of self-armed farmer soldiers who acquired voting rights based on their participation in war. So in a sense, there was always a strong link between uh, democracy and war uh, early, early on, and it, it continued on. Obviously, we could see that in the context of the US and Britain and, and things like that. We also know that parliamentary systems that we take for granted today owe their existence, the, the origins to, uh, as Otto Hinze showed a long time ago, to medieval congregations of warriors. So we wouldn't have a parliamentary system if it wasn't some sort of uh, division of uh, power structure between the rulers, the monarchs, and, and the kind of various 
lords uh, in medieval Europe. And obviously different uh, congregations have emerged in different parts of the world. Uh, we also know that uh, state, the institutions of the state, such as administration, effective uh, systems of revenue collection, uh, the development of infrastructure, transport communication systems, you know, Tilly, Mann, Giddens have uh, analyzed this very extensively. They all, they all developed very much through war, through kind of protracted wars in European continent, through the kind of colonial expansion, uh, through lines on, on violence and things like that. Uh, we can also look a little bit more closely at the way how uh, states were uh, have decided really to implement compulsory educational systems, uh, which were in part obviously in order to provide certain skills, but also to develop a sense of uh, national loyalty among their populations to inculcate certain national values to generate kind of nationalistic support and to, in that sense, allow for mass military recruitment, you know, so in that sense, we could also see in, in the early uh, kind of modernity and uh, how, how this link was crucial. Uh, war was also very much uh, uh, kind of a, a, a context uh, around which science and technology have emerged, you know, the the, all, all the kind of technological innovations were pioneered in the military sector and then found their mass application elsewhere. And we can go historically, you know, into this from, you know, uh, early on uh, stirrup and wheel to compass and assembly lane and fast food and internet and robotics. And this continues on, you know, most, most states invest uh, heavily in new technologies and, and science uh, uh, in, in the military sphere. And then that comes uh, gradually to the civilian sector. Uh, we can also see how expansion of warfare was instrumental in the rise of the public sphere development, uh, which came together in, in many respects with industrialization and urbanization, many of which were linked with the military sector, in, uh, in a sense. Warfare has also stimulated increased literacy rates, in part by kind of providing these compulsory education systems for nationalist uh, education, if you like. Uh, war was central in the proliferation of mass media, if you uh, if we you know, look historically, for example, the Crimea wars of the early 19th century and the uh, you know, central development of the, of the independent newspapers and ability of ordinary people to, to see that, you know, to follow what's going on on the, on the battlefield uh, is very much linked with, with, with again, with the, with the war itself. Uh, Mann and, and also uh, Celia Walby and uh, uh, Jonathan Turner and others have uh, explore the relationship between uh, citizenship. They were linked with warfare in some respects as well. Uh, war has been also crucial in changing, influencing, transforming gender relations and uh, ultimately the legitimization of racism as an ongoing phenomenon. Uh, obviously, we know that both uh, uh, total wars, First World War and Second World War, uh, were crucial in opening the labor force uh, for women because there was a shortage, obviously, of men who had to be sent to the front lines. Uh, so, so that was obviously not intended. It was an un unintended consequence of warfare, uh, which ultimately transformed gender dynamics uh, forever. It was very difficult, even though many governments in 1950s, late 40s and 50s tried to revert uh, everything back, but it was too late. And, and, and the consequence, I would argue, even the 1960s, uh, uprisings, uh, uh, you know, social movements were linked in some respects to these changes that were consequence of the Second World War. Uh, we also know that obviously the, the mass participation of uh, uh, soldiers from the colonies, uh, uh, Tariq Barkavi has written a very good book really on this, on the, uh, you know, the mass participation of Indian soldiers in, in, the, in the British army, uh, that has the legitimized kind of colonial ideas and the imperial project uh, so, so in that sense, we can say how war ultimately, again, as, as an unintended consequence, uh, had, uh, you know, contribute, has contributed to the legitimization of racism and imperialism, uh, although this is obviously very much an, an ongoing project and war also contributes as well to, to militarization. So there are the, these different sides of warfare that one can identify. So what's interesting really for us, and try to conclude now, probably uh, uh, coming to, uh, to 10 minutes, the, what, what is emphasized, it's crucial for us to emphasize is that sociologists now understand much better that war is not some kind of side issue that we should be paying attention only when, you know, there is a, a, a one war that is relevant to us like Ukraine and we didn't pay attention obviously to 
uh, Yemeni war and war in Ethiopia or so many other ongoing conflicts. So, so it shows us how we live with war, even if we, we are not aware of it, that we, we live through these legacies of previous wars. And in that sense, war is not something that, you know, suddenly comes out, interrupts normal social life. It is a phenomenon that has historically shaped and continues to shape nearly all aspects of social life. So in some respects, obviously, this is one element, one story. Uh, John has also focused on the peace side of this uh, story and uh, you know, Sylvia and Larry and others will look at the kind of micro dynamics and, and the links of violence. So in a sense, we need all these stories to understand as a sociologist how organized violence works in everyday life. So I'll stop here. Thank you.